Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today we wanted to tackle the topic of cults, which has been a topic that has been suggested to us by several listeners. And we're going to do what we always do, which is try to examine it from a Jungian perspective and uh, see how we can understand this fairly ubiquitous phenomenon of being subjected to undue influence through a Jungian lens. I'm thinking about, um, I'm responding to your, resonating to your comment about undue influence. And uh, where I've gone is maybe in the opposite direction, which is to our human longing to belong, our human need for a family. Even if that family can be very strict or demanding or challenging, we belong. And it seems to me that this current environment, cultural environment that we're in, is one that's very fragmented, that demands that we find our own places of security and career direction and and maturation and puts us very much in ourselves with this unbelievably daunting task that we be all things to ourselves. And that the cult phenomenon, although it's probably as old as time, has taken on new energy as a compensatory way of providing people with structure and a sense of meaning and belonging. Absolutely. It really speaks to our deep need for meaning and and belonging both. My hunch would be, and I know that there are some social scientists studying this, that participation in in what we would think of as cults probably increases where traditional religions uh, are losing their influence because they kind of replace that. It's, you know, it's Jung talked about the religious function of the psyche that we're wired to need to relate to the transpersonal. And one of the functions that a cult fulfills or can fulfill in a person's life is a conduit or, you know, an alleged conduit to the transpersonal. Absolutely. I agree with you completely that churches and other religious institutions have always been the containers of the very powerful archetypes that are the religious function of the psyche, providing members with with images and a safe pathway to the archetypal world, to the transpersonal. These smaller fragments of smaller cults are attempting, I think, to be those conduits and to, and to hold the archetypes. But they're too small or too one-sided often to, to really serve a well-balanced function. And as we were talking about this idea of both belonging and perhaps prioritizing a relationship to an emerging archetype, this can serve a stage in individuation. That if somebody has been raised in a home with certain belief structures and or certain religious rules, by actually being emerged in a very different kind of culture, it allows somebody to sometimes even rather radically step totally out of a, an old paradigm and into a new, which can be euphoric and incredibly liberating, at least initially. So one of the things that the listeners are probably hearing is that the word cult has become pejorative, but cult is derived etymologically from the same word as culture. And it it really means to cultivate, to grow something, to develop something. In it of itself, the idea of the cult is neither good nor bad. It's a social phenomena. But I think based upon social norms and what we consider to be outside what's acceptable as a social norm, we tend to categorize dangerous cults versus kind of neutral cults and then benign cults and things that actually might be somewhat helpful. 
most times people are really stirred up about what they think of as dangerous cults. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, those can be a big problem. And in some of my work recently, I've had the opportunity to learn more about cults and to to learn from and read the works of some experts in cults. And one of the things that has really, really hit me as I've gone through this exploration is, you know, I think I used to think of cults as um, this very fascinating, but rare thing. I, I was a kid when Jonestown happened. And I, I remember hearing about it on the radio and just being gripped. And I, you know, I still just, you know, wow. I mean, talk about, talk about really exposing the human susceptibility to influence. You know, I mean, I, I think it's important to say, wow, it's not that those people went and did that. It's that that could happen to any of us. And in fact, the, the research does bear that out. I mean, it's, it's not that, that people who join extreme cults sort of fit a certain prototype or are or, or weaker than other people. It's, it's that this could happen to any of us at a, at a time when we're vulnerable or a time of transition. We all have this susceptibility to influence. And this phenomenon is widespread. It's not just the occasional thing that you hear about in the news. Uh, one of the people that I've had the good fortune to learn from is um, Steve Hassan, who uh, has written about cults, and he talks about undue influence, and there's a real kind of spectrum of influence that that he identifies, which feels absolutely accurate to me, that it, an undue influence relationship can be two people. It could be in a case of like domestic violence, where one person has a lot of control and influence over the other, and having done work with domestic violence victims, that feels absolutely accurate all the way up to mass political movements like communism or fascism, where a large part of the population is sort of held sway with these really extreme beliefs. And then everything in between, right? And these would all be examples of undue influence. And undue influence in a way that could injure someone. Undue influence in a way that could even be life-threatening or could impoverish somebody. You know, there, there are all kinds of frightening stories of people giving away all their assets in order to lead a liberated spiritual life only to discover after a few years that they have nothing left when it's time to leave. So there's certainly frightening stories like that. Right, Joseph. And I think another cost is often estrangement from family. Yes, which then makes someone retain a a tighter grip on a cult because it becomes the lifeline because other things have been lost. Right. As you were saying earlier, Deb, you feel like you have to stay in because that is your new family and we all need that. We all need that belonging. And psychically, there's a a tremendous need. I'm thinking about the the religious instinct that Jung stressed a great deal in his writings and linking it to what we needed for thousands and thousands of years, which was a family, a tribe, a clan. Uh, We would not have survived on our own. Uh, we could not, individuals could not be self-sufficient and meet all their needs. And that psychically, uh, cults uh, serve that same kind of need. And it might be a branch of some, you know, larger institution, uh, split off ultra fundamentalist or isolated version of some uh, mainstream or relatively mainstream belief. But that's what makes it so hard to separate is the psychic pull of a family and support and comfort it still remains a primary need for lots of people. So that would be a very kind of humanistic way of understanding the appeal to join a cult. Eric Fromm wrote a marvelous book called Escape from Freedom, which also brings in an existential dimension which is that as human beings develop and become increasingly aware, there is also a sense that all of the responsibilities in my life and their outcomes rest on my shoulders and that I am fully responsible for shaping this life, whether it's painful or pleasurable. And when people sit really in the truth of the responsibility of their lives, there are innumerable ways in which they want to escape from that. And one of the ways that they can escape from it is to hand the responsibility of those decisions over to kind of charismatic leaders 
and whether or not the leader even thinks of themselves as a cult leader, but are particularly authoritative or charismatic, people who have a weak sense of self or are frightened of taking responsibility will often just kind of hand their lives over to a system, to a set of ideas, to instructions. We see this you know, in political movements right now. We're seeing this kind of roaring excitement as people are invited to hand over their decision-making, to, to just tacitly believe what a news station that's functioning as a propaganda machine is churning out. Because to actually check on those facts or investigate it extensively puts people back in this feeling that they're actually responsible for what they put into their brains. Yes. And, and just to clarify on that point, that is happening, Joseph, your reference to politics and news organizations. That's absolutely happening on the right and on the left. I am so taken with your reference to uh, these cultural patterns that we see lest we uh, get into our sort of superior and somewhat judgmental phase of thinking about things like the, the Branch Davidians or some of these other, uh, Jonestown and some of these other really extreme cults. And I'm thinking about how in a cult, as in the great political divides of our nation today, what you cannot do is challenge the dogma of the cult. You cannot challenge it. You are not to think independently. You are not to go and do your own research. You are to accept what is uh, given to you. And how strong these belief systems are. How often do we go and do our own fact checking? Yeah. And um, boy, that is such a great question that does speak a lot to, I think, what's going on politically, again, across the spectrum. But I wanted to hop back for one second to Joseph, what you were saying, which I think is really important about the desire to hand over responsibility for your own life to other people. And Jung talks about this, actually, he doesn't use the word cult, but that is what he's that is what he's referencing in volume seven, actually. It's volume seven, if anyone wants to follow along, paragraph 263, he says, <laughs> <laughs> The disciple is unworthy. Modestly, he sits at the master's feet and guards against having ideas of his own. Mental laziness becomes a virtue. One can at least bask in the sun of a semi-divine being. He can enjoy the archaism and infantilism of his unconscious fantasies without loss to himself, for all responsibility is laid at the master's door. Through his deification of the master, the disciple, apparently without noticing it, waxes in stature. Moreover, he does he not possess the great truth? Not his own discovery, of course, but received straight from the master's hands. It seems like such an image of parent to child. Uh, you have to go and wash your hands before dinner. Uh, then you have to go upstairs and take a bath after dinner. Uh, but don't forget to brush your teeth. And how comforting that is to be held. Mm -hmm. It is very comforting. And uh, with, without perhaps uh, cultural pathways that are well-defined and established and safe, Perhaps people tend to stay in that place of child to an overarching parental force instead and le not leave the protected garden of childhood. Or I think when we're talking about dangerous cults, to not be permitted. See, there are plenty of organizations, let's say the Boy Scouts, you know, where as a, as a boy, I came into the Boy Scouts. There's all kinds of skills that I don't know that I have to oh. kind of decide to become receptive, to adapt, to learn things, to submit to an authority structure that's there. But if the scoutmaster and the other parents are imagining that this is a developmental stage, and that of course you would outgrow the Boy Scouts, but perhaps these values would be useful to you later on. And, you know, one goes through these, you know, you have these different ranks, in Boy Scout, and you finally become first class, and then you you join this kind of you know patrol leader core of, of character development. Joseph, were you really in the Boy Scouts? I was really in the Boy Scouts. I love the Boy Scouts. I am like totally thumbs up for the Boy Scouts. You know, and I was raised in suburban Long Island, so learning how to build a fire and wilderness survival it was incredibly exciting. Okay. But the difference was 
you know, at a certain age, you're done. Bye bye. You've graduated, right? Yes. I think in a dangerous cult, there's a sense that you're coming to learn, things will be imparted, but you must consistently maintain that relationship and perhaps be threatened in one way or another if you try or show signs of outgrowing. Yeah. You never leave and you never grow. It is static. This is what we believe. This is how we do things. This is the hierarchical hierarchical order of things, and it will never change. I also think that there's somewhat a contract with something like the Boy Scouts, right? Or, or other things too, where it's like, you know, you're going to follow our rules mm-hmm. and you owe us, you know, an hour and a half on Saturday, right? Uh, rather than it's something more kind of totalist where, this is going, you're, sci- you're, cu- you're giving us everything. You're giving us access to your whole psyche. Maybe you're giving us all of your possessions. So it's sort of how much, how much ground does something claim? But I, I do think, Deb, your point about, you know, there can be no questioning. That is a real sign that something's amiss. I mean, here, I'll go right for it. A lot of people have said to me, is Jungian training a cult? <laughs> <laughs> and I had previous training in Gestalt theory and therapy, and that was the same question. Is it a cult? Yeah. And, and I mean, we did used to joke about it. I'm not going to lie. But, but the wonderful thing is I, I actually will say to people, I'll say, well, absolutely not. Because at least in the training that the three of us did, we were encouraged to question, to question Jung's ideas, to to read widely other people's thoughts, to develop our own understanding, uh, which, which I think that that's how you know you're in a cult is you're you're discouraged from seeking other sources of information, you're discouraged from developing your own thoughts, you're discouraged from disagreeing with the dogma. In fact, I would say uh, my experience of training in Philadelphia and at interregional. And in one's own analysis and supervision was that contentiousness was a gigantic part of the process of there were interpersonal conflicts and conflicts within myself and conflicts with other trainees and the list went on and on and on. So it was sort of like a rasping away of a lot of my little prickly points of defense, unlike a here you go, believe this, and uh, everyone will be the same. And I do think that sameness is a huge uh, defining characteristic of cults. And the sameness that pervades all the areas of the life. You know, because, for instance, somebody might want to become a Shriner. And, and for the time that they're all together with their fellow Shriners and they're doing a fundraiser, there is this sense that we're all in this together. We're all going to wear those little hats and each one's bought a little car to drive for the parade. And in that feeling of sameness and achieving this goal of funding the Shriners hospitals, there is a joy in sameness. But where I think it benign versus dangerous is if that sameness became something that invaded your life 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that you're totally colonized by the, that all the time, then it becomes different. But there are times where that participation mystique is one of the terms that uh, Jung borrowed from an earlier psychoanalyst, which allowed, was it Levi Bruhl, I think it was uh, where he got it from, which is this idea that human beings also naturally will relax down out of the independent sense of self and in that kind of slightly dreamy part of themselves can feel merged with uh, other people, with groups, with ideals, um, religions, all kinds of stuff, but they don't really notice it. And that sense of participation mystique, you know, I mean, we, we, that's the feeling maybe that you have when you go to a giant dance party and the music's loud and the lights are, you know, flashing and you're dancing and you just feel like there's an at one minute with everyone else. Or if you go to a parade on the 4th of July and your, your eyes, you know, tears spring to your eyes as the floats pass by and you don't even know what's happening to you, you know, but the music and, it's the sense of a kind of collective psychology a little bit. Like that, again, we're all susceptible to, and it can feel really good 
and it can be a positive force. Uh, I mean, I think we've we've talked about this a little bit before on earlier episodes. And Jung was very wary of it. But I think it's very normal. Uh, all all these feelings of uh, getting wrapped up in a concert. Um, all the people that probably a lot of our listeners have watched um, Bohemian Rhapsody and how the audience interacted with the band Queen. But the, the defining characteristic for me is you step out of it. It's not your whole life. And it's like the Boy Scouts. You graduate, you become an Eagle Scout, and then you move on to the next phase of life. And that with a cult, the sameness continues. It's all or nothing. And it is static. And uh, I have a couple of quotes just to kind of flush this out a little bit. So in uh, Psychological Types, Jung writes, Participation mystique is a term derived from Levi Brule. It denotes a peculiar kind of psychological connection with objects and consists in the fact that the subject cannot clearly distinguish himself from the object, but is bound to it by a direct relationship which amounts to partial identity. So for those that are might be confused by the word object. That could be a, pe- a person, a movement, a symbol. You know, if we think about something very extreme, you know, the rise of the Nazi movement in Germany, you know, that people identified in droves with these symbols and values and behaviors uh, and felt swept into it as, you know, kind of like a flock of birds all moving in a direction and perhaps not even noticing it. Because when we are identified or we feel identified with something, we don't even think to question it. It just feels true. I just am like this. And Jung also speculated that in more ancient cultures where tribal survival was predicated on functioning very, very much as a group and being very, very much identified with the group, that process of becoming an individual and separating out, you know, was a problem and perhaps even a survival problem. So there is this kind of ancestral impulse around how, how tightly we are in the group and whether or not we can even afford to step but so far from the group. Yeah, I think you're, you're talking about identity. You know, identity is sameness, and and there is this kind of longing for sameness to kind of collapse ourselves into something that is very familiar or becomes familiar and then it, and then it's the thing that we crave particularly when anxieties are high that's what i was thinking about in uh, germany and the rise of the nazi movement is what was going on in the german collective that made them so vulnerable to the image that hitler presented of certainty and power and identity and purity and, you know, whatever, all the things that Hitler stood for, that there was a vulnerability, a pre-existing vulnerability, which, uh, according to my admittedly limited reading about this, uh, stemmed from the humiliation and devastation that Germany suffered after the First World War which makes me, you know, go back to what's going on in our collective, that it seems that so many uh, cults and specific identity uh, groups seem to be proliferating. And specific cults can often be hidden within a culture, but we could talk about cultish behaviors, cultish attitudes. And I think that that might be something people can see more easily in broad sweeps. I think like historically we say, yes, this Germany was susceptible to this because of the, uh, you know, devastation of world war one and the humiliation. And that's all true. But I'm also thinking, you know, psychologically, you know, something really important happened sort of at the end of the 19th century, or it had been happening, but it sort of probably reached its culmination around then. And that is um, that the traditional religion in Western culture was really losing its hold. And that's when Freud and Jung enter the scene. And I mean, the, the 20th century, as we know, 
was really characterized by these destructive mass movements. And I don't know that I think that that's a, a coincidence. Now, having said that, I'm not, I'm not being a blanket apologist for, let's say, you know, Catholicism or Protestantism, because we, we just have to look at the previous centuries to see the death and destruction that those <laughs> those uh, launched or 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 led to. So I, I'm not saying that. Gee, if we just all went back to being Catholic, everything would be uh, fine. But I but I do think that what we're seeing is the psychological truth that Jung pointed to that we need, as we said in the beginning, we need a sense of belonging. We need to belong to the tribe, and we need a way to relate to something larger than ourselves. And you know, in this section that I was reading from before, from volume seven, it's this little section called Identification with the Collective Psyche. And he talks about when people have a connection with the primal source of life and how there's just this, uh, he calls it, it's, it's the longing for the mother. It's the nostalgia for the source from which we came. And, and, it's, and it's that, I think, that can get activated with this tendency toward losing ourselves in a cult-like mentality. And he discusses it specifically in terms of incest and that, that uh, wanting to return to the source of life. And that, that seems like an easy answer. And then we don't have to think. And, and when Jung was using the uh, archetype of incest in the way that Freud also used the archetype of, you know, the parental child relationships, Jung was interested in, in the way that People are unconsciously wanting to join with what is most familiar to them, what they have the closest relationship to do, what, what is accessible to them, but yet still has a kind of taboo, transgressive feeling around it uh, and is, could be very powerful and even overwhelming to them. So it has to be dealt with, you know, in a very judicious way. Yeah, in a way, it's a real image of just kind of handing over consciousness and wanting to kind of go back into that euroboric state of undifferentiation, where you don't have to think for yourself. I'm struck by your uh, reference via Jung to the desire and the longing for the mother. I'm thinking about how for centuries and centuries, the Catholic Church, which was sort of, you know, that was the Christian overarching institution, was always the mother church and contained those longings um, in a much more organized and doctrinal way. And I'm thinking about perhaps that's what our culture is longing for, too, is something that is not just regressive but something that is more receptive, more nurturing, more empathic, more compassionate, and simply more related. I think a lot of our culture uh, feels from you know, businesses to news channels to uh, all kinds of things, a feeling that we have of, hey, every man for himself, you know, good luck, you're on your own, that there's a, something healthy in the longing for what we might term values around mother and mothering. Yes, I think the idea of communalism and communal living around certain ideas, whether that's an ashram or whether it's some other kind of conscious community, you know, out in the Pacific Northwest, you know, that people naturally want to gravitate. And they also want to enjoy a system of belief that is affirmed by other people around them. And to not have to constantly contend with what they think is the prevailing tension against it. So in that regard, people do want to kind of seal themselves off and not have to fight all the time. And, and again, not a bad thing necessarily that we have to observe very carefully, you know, what the results are and objectively what the results are. So the word cult is often thrown out in a universally pejorative way now. But when we hear that word, you know, our ears should kind of pick up a little bit, and then we have to listen more deeply. Is that just a knee-jerk reaction because, you know, your kid's doing something different and maybe something that separates them out from what you think they should be? Or is there anything truly dangerous happening? Because people you know, move into these in and out of kinds of intense relationships with groups. 
Yes. And I, and I, and I do think having, you know, <laughs> as a mother of teens, you know, I can see now more clearly than at any time, other time in my life, the danger, especially young people. And my, I don't know this for a fact. My guess would be that many people who join cults are sort of um, late teens, young adults that this is a, a monumental transition to adulthood in which things feel very uncertain. And the temptation to join into something that promises transcendence, that promises certainty, that promises certainty. I mean, I think that that's a big part of what cults offer, is that we are right, we have the answer. You know, there must be a tremendous temptation. And when you hand over your faculty of, of critical judgment, I think that's always a little frightening. It may be that the people move in and out of it. And listen, I, I know of cases of people in what we would clearly think of cults like the Moonies, where their family members say, you know what, he's doing better there than he's ever done in his life. And it seems to really work for him. So I'm I'm, I, I think you're right, Joseph, that, it, it, you know, we can't, there isn't some clear way to delineate what's, what's harmful and what's not. But I do think that we have an instinct often when we see this happening to a loved one, maybe, that it looks really dangerous, even if we can't quite put our finger on why. This idea about certainty, I mean, I think that, um, you know, we do not like to feel uncertain, we as human beings, and we also don't like to experience inner conflict, uh, what, what, um, what some psychologists refer to as cognitive dissonance. So when we believe something that then is contradicted by other people around us or by what we see or observe, it is deeply, deeply uncomfortable and we will do a lot to resolve that sense of cognitive dissonance. And this relates to cults, because I think that cults kind of promise us, or they can promise us to resolve all kinds of dissonance. You know, we are right, there is one way, believe us. There were some psychologists who were discovering, uh, uh, excuse me, they were researching this phenomenon of cognitive dissonance. I believe it was in the 1940s or 50s, they were researching a doomsday cult that said, you know, the earth is going to end next Wednesday or something. And they wanted to find out what happened when next Wednesday came and went. And what they discovered is the cult members didn't say, oh, gosh, I guess we had that wrong. They doubled down on the false belief and came up with another belief to explain, well, you know, uh, the earth wasn't destroyed because the cult had done thus and such a thing, and therefore they're giving us another chance. I, I can't remember the details, but there was some other belief that was offered that resolved the cognitive dissonance. And, you know, if you think about it, oh, listener, <laughs> I bet you can find ways that you have done such a thing with your own cognitive dissonance. I know I have. We have to uh, create a story or a new narrative that will align with our pre-existing beliefs. So perhaps because uh, you know the world didn't end on the predicted day, it was because we didn't um, do the rituals well enough. Uh, we weren't uh, we weren't devoted enough. Some other there are all kinds of possible explanations that will reinforce the uh, pre-existing need to remain in the same absolutely true, unquestionable, definite storyline. And I, I'm thinking about young people who are perhaps the age group most susceptible uh, to joining cults. Sometimes they're called families. That it may be a stepping stone that's needed temporarily to step into more ego strength and the ability to take hold of one's life uh, as a in, more independent person. And I'm thinking about how it could go the other direction of just permanently uh, surrendering a sense of belonging and a narrative and a belief structure that prevents one from maturing. And I think that um, when I look at the literature around cults, it is the resistance of the cult to allow people to move on or to support them to move on or expect them to move on once they've learned something. That that, I think, is often the sticking point. And that, and that can look like even a very conventional church. I mean, that idea of, you know, we're going to punish you or pull you back, you know, if you stray from from whatever the paradigm is. 
any time that happens, then I think we have to look very critically at how much power an organization is is exhibiting over the individual. Absolutely. And I'm going to build that out into the wider collective of between um, the people that watch, let's say, Fox News and the people that watch, let's say, CNN. And what are the underlying belief systems that pull people to one news channel or another, or you know, reading the so-called liberal press versus other kinds of media uh, organizations and outlets? It's not as if this is restricted to those really horrible cults that believed in the Hail Bob Comet or uh, something like that. It it's in our culture, and it's probably in all of us. Yeah, I think it's just very human. You know, it's and this, of course, is related to what Jung referred to as holding the tension of the opposites. Oh, my goodness. I mean, be, being able to have one belief over here and another belief over here that are in contradiction to each other and seem irreconcilable, there's a tendency to want to collapse the tension by just picking one and going with it and clinging to it really hard. But we might be able to say, well, somehow it's paradoxical, but somehow both things are true. And I can hold that. You know, that, that takes a tremendous amount of um, psychological strength, I think, to be able to do that. But it's really what we must do. To manage differences. That is the Jungian concept of holding the tension of the opposites. And how do we do that in our lives and with members of our own family, our neighbors, um, and so it goes. And and that's a good question of how does one hold the tension of the opposites? And one uh, movement is to simply be a, acquainted with the idea of that, to, to start with it from a conceptual frame, that things are often grouped together in the consciousness as polarities. You know, someone's going to be you know, chaste, or somebody's going to be um, libidinous. Somebody's going to be poor. Somebody's going to be wealthy. And human beings tend to group things in these polarities. Someone's going to be honest. Someone's going to be a liar. So to begin to speculate that we have all of these qualities inside of the human soul, and that to be able to tolerate or even conceive that it might be possible that the other side is in me and part of me. Just from a a thought level, that can begin to start a journey. I like what you're saying, Joseph, of holding it as an idea, as an intellectual concept. And I often think of it as like a, a coffee maker and let it percolate on down. I don't think the human species was particularly made for introspection. We were made to watch out for dangerous animals and um, hunt other animals, and grow things and live in clans. So it's this age does require that we introspect, that we think about, wow, what's going on in me? Why am I reacting this way? Um, I'll loop it back into yourself and into myself and try to understand what I am doing and then see what differences and other possibilities there may be in engaging the other. And Jung said something, perhaps in conclusion, as we prepare to move towards the dream. He was concerned about movements and isms and, you know, people coming together and forming, you know, these charging groups. And he famously said, thank God I'm Jung and not a Jungian. (laughs) That Jungianism was kind of structuring into a movement around him. And you know, he would kind of slap his hand against his forehead and think, oh, you know, in a perfect world, I think Jung might have wanted everybody to just go through a journey, perhaps similar to what he had. So they would create their own school of thought, school of being. Yeah, he called that individuation of becoming your own whole individual unique self. But here we are as Jungians, despite (laughs) his best efforts. Yes, here we are. And, you know, uh, before we um, go to a dream, I am aware, and so are you, Joseph, that something very exciting is happening for you, Lisa. And I'm just going to say, we've known each other for quite a long time. 
I know you have been working on this book for at least 10 years, maybe more. And now it is makes me uh, teary. It is going to be published. And why don't you say a little bit about your uh, long-held work that's coming to fruition? Thank you so much, Deb. Yes, um, so excited that the I just got word that the announcement was um, released to the publisher's marketplace newsletter this morning that um, my my book, which is uh, tentatively titled "Down the Deep Well," uh, has been uh, sold to Sounds True Publishers, which is a wonderful um, publisher that has published many of our Jungian colleagues before, and I'm so excited. And it will be um, it will come out in the spring of 2021. I use the universal wisdom of fairy tales and myth to explore motherhood as a rich opportunity for personal growth. And yes, I have been working on this now for 10 years or so. So I'm very, very excited and grateful to both Sounds True and to my age- agent, Adriana Stimola. Oh, and this is a book for general readership. It's a psychologically oriented book, but it's not for, it's not a textbook, right? It's right. It's absolutely, thank you, Deb. It is absolutely for mothers who want to reflect psychologically on their experience. And my hope is that it will be very accessible to the general reader. Yes, and that all people, including men, are interested in the idea of the mother and motherhood, and what it is to mother another life. So I think the, the the attraction to it is very wide. That's such a good point, because motherhood is archetypal. It's not just uh, women with small children. It's one of these enormous archetypes that shapes every human being. So all of the the wisdom we can know about this you know, contributes to all of us. Well, We're thrilled for you, Lisa. Uh, You've worked for it, and congratulations. Thanks. Congratulations. Hi, this is Joseph from This Jungian Life podcast. Lisa, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us with as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Okay, so now we may uh, move to a dream. This is a a 25-year-old woman who writes... I am my current self with my current boyfriend, but I had just got married to a woman. This woman had a very powerful presence and felt radiant. She gave me a beautiful silver ring with a turquoise stone, but it didn't fit properly, so I kept losing it. Each time I found it, she would add to the ring and make it even more beautiful. I told my boyfriend that I married her and that I'm very happy. He took it well and asked if we could still talk to each other and see each other every day. I said I didn't think there was a problem with that. The dreamer adds some context. She says this was my first dream after a few stressful months, that she'd made a big decision and felt as if her uh, life is on the right path. She also comments that she has a silver ring with a turquoise stone and had worn it the day after the dream, and it does fit her ring finger. Uh, It felt like she had a secret. I'm struck by the very first sentence, my current self with my current boyfriend, but I just got married to a woman. It feels like, wow, here's a great way to have it all. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure who to attribute this quote to, but uh, someone had said that all human experience is not alien to me. Mm -hmm. And for us, it feels, yeah. 
Is it Freud? Yeah. It's that we have such a full sense of our inner life, not that we've lived every experience, but we have given our imaginations permission to enter into every possible kind of human experience, to have a, a sense of resonance with it, painful, pleasurable, unusual. So this sounds expansive. And I'd like to bring up just, um, oh, I was going to say a rule of thumb, but then anytime we say a rule, that's tricky. But in Jungian dream work, often we consider the sex of the dreamer, and we have this idea that the contrasexual image in this dream, it would be the male image, often represents this animus or the inner man. And that same gendered images can represent shadow figures, but sometimes self figures as well. I find myself just toying with this idea of the different roles or the different levels of the psyche that this woman she's married might be resonant with. If we had the streamer here, I'd be really curious if there's more to know about this woman. What does she look like? How old she is? Does she remind you of anyone? I would ask a whole bunch of questions like that because, I mean, clearly this dream depicts this wonderful thing that we all hope for, which is the inner marriage. Is this a self figure or is this, I mean, again, sort of, I like your your hesitance around rule of thumb, but, you know, I always think about it as like a place to start. You know, is this a positive shadow? that she's sort of integrating by becoming married to. So it, we might know more about that if we knew about the specific situation of the dreamer's life. What was the decision that she just made? And what about the, the appearance of this woman in the dream? But certainly there is some kind of um, integration or one of the ways that Jung, one of the words he used for it is conjunctio, a marriage, a wedding with, with some inner capacity there can be marriages of, of difference and then marriages of sameness. And I'd like to bring up um, just a little mythologic example that's not widely known. Most people are familiar with Eros or Cupid as the god of love, who is the child of Venus and Ares. But um, a much lesser known myth is the myth of Anteros, who is the brother of Eros. And in one of the stories, Eros is born, the god of love, and he's failing to thrive. And Venus, Aphrodite, is, is distraught and goes to one of the mother goddesses and says, I just don't know what to do. And the mother goddess says, you need to have a second child. So she returns to Ares and they have a second child, another boy named Anteros. And if we're very perceptive in some of the classic artwork, Eros is generally depicted with bird wings, and Anteros is generally depicted with butterfly wings or dark wings. So Eros shoots arrows, which causes people to fall in love, and Anteros punishes those who do not respond to love and carries around a lead club and smacks people with it. <laughs> <laughs> and we've all had that experience of having our love not returned and how we'd like to really smack somebody for not returning it. And that's the Anteros principle. When Anteros is born and the two are put together, that the play between them is so robust and so dynamic that Eros begins to thrive. And anytime they are separated, he fails. And when they are restored to each other, Eros or love increases. So there is a paradigm for the maturation of dynamism and love through the connection or the marriage of sameness. That's a really illustrative uh, example of uh, the kind of need in the psyche for sameness as well as, as difference. And that in the psyche, the, the boyfriend opposite sex is the other. Uh, would you say that's true, that you have an Eros and Anteros principle um, possibly operating right in this dream? I think it's possible. I mean, I'd love to talk with the dreamer, you know, a couple of months hence and see whether or not her relationship to the boyfriend is actually invigorated because she has an inner marriage of a sameness, which allows Eros or the love principle to actually grow and be more zesty 
and perhaps even a little bit more feisty. The boyfriend is going to stick around, which I like in the end of the dream. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it, it all feels really positive. I'm going back, Joseph, to what you, you you were sort of referencing earlier about the possibility that it's a self figure. And I would like to suggest that the dream offers some support for that thesis because she gives her a ring. A ring, you know, rings have enormous significance. You know, they obviously, you know, signify kind of a pledge or a commitment. Um, But rings are round and therefore can also possibly be a symbol of the self. And it has a semi-precious stone in it, which can be another image of the self. Um, and and I, I think this the ring business is fairly important in this dream. And there's this curious thing about how it doesn't fit, so she keeps losing it, which I which I think is interesting. And I wondered what we do with it with that. Well, I'm thinking um, I agree with you. This ring uh, symbol is really important. That it she hasn't grown into it yet. You know, if it doesn't fit, it's obviously too big because she keeps losing it. And I'm also liking your idea that this woman has uh, some aspects as a self-image with a capital S. But the the self-figure, if I may call it that, she returns it. Each time I found it, she would add to, the, add to the ring and make it even more beautiful. And she married her. She said, I told my boyfriend I married her. I'm very happy. So it feels like something she is growing into and that this, uh, the image is one that is generous of, okay, you know, doesn't fit yet. It's a little too big for you still, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to add to it and give you, give it to you again, return it. It feels like hopefulness, generosity and further enrichment. It carries that as for me as well. And when something is lost and returned, and we translate that into purely psychological language, it might also be that something is falling in and out of awareness, that the ring is lost, and and there is a kind of forgetting that she has married this figure, which could be the self or an aspect of her own feminine personality, but that it falls away, as you had said, Deb, she hasn't kind of grown into thinking of herself in this inner relationship all the time. But the the figure that is really interested in knowing the waking consciousness just keeps coming back in a lovely way, in an appealing way, in an inviting way, until the ego can really stay aware of her as an abiding presence. And she says um, that this relationship with an inner figure and her own self is uh, symbolized by the silver ring with a turquoise stone which the dreamer actually does possess. And which feels like a wonderful secret. Yes, it feels like a wonderful secret. It also brings us to a lovely idea of just a gentle ritualization of our dreams. That just that little sense of, well, rings are important, so I'm going to wear a ring that reminds me of it. And and to allow or help us to embody an aspect of a dream, particularly a dream that feels very supportive. And she says that she had uh, had a conflict and made a big decision in her life and that it felt like she was on the right path. So although she doesn't say what it was, if this dream does feel like an affirmation of her having wrestled something through, held whatever kind of tension um, was involved in making this decision, and that the dream is confirming that she has, through this process, I've grown into more wholeness as a psyche person connection with her deeper self. It's really lovely. Well, that sounds like a good place to stop for today. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.